principal of the Barbados Community College, Mr. Delore, and distinguished guests and participants all. I'm here this morning because I believe that my presence and my voice is critical to this effort. For many years, you have heard me speak about the importance of us turning away from the legacy of an adversarial system that has really have come out of a Victorian approach to criminal justice. We cannot continue into the 21st century with a 19th century approach to justice. We have also seen the evolution of how our populations have embraced other aspects of living that were hitherto treated with disdain. I refer specifically to the issue of mental wellness. I've said over and over that particularly with the COVID pandemic, we have seen a long, long shadow that would suggest a mental health epidemic across the world. People need to breathe. People need to let go. People need to get rid of the angst and the anxiety. And more often than not, the failure so to do leads to difficulties, disputes, and regrettably, injury and loss of life. We believe, as I said in October when unfolding, government's approach to fight violence, and in particular gun violence, that there must be a multifaceted approach that looks not just at the question of the courts, processing cases at a much quicker rate, recognizing that 80% of the murder cases still before our court system, and hopefully it is probably in the high 70s now, because we have appointed an additional three judges, bringing the numbers from two to five to eight, and those additional three have been appointed because COVID literally robbed us of the ability to conduct jury trials for about two years. Secondly, we also agreed that we should strengthen the Barbados Police Service with respect to its community policing, as well as its capacity to be able to prepare for cases at a much more um, efficient, efficient and quicker rate than it has been able to do so, largely because of both systems and lack of personnel. And finally, ultimately, that the fight against violence is a fight of each and every one of us at the community level. How we raise our children, how we resolve conflict in our households, how we use language, I've argued for some time that there must be a commitment to the mastery of language, particularly in our case, not just dialect, but English language, because words have nuance. And if you are capable of expressing exactly how you feel, that allows you to move your mood and your temperature from 100 degrees right back down to something that is palatable. But your failure to express yourself then means that you have to find some way to release that energy. Decades ago, when people picked up a two by three, it was wrong then, but a victim of the two by three could survive. When people pick up now today weapons that are manufactured to kill, and to kill not in communities, but to kill in wars, then we have a problem. And we have, therefore, to work harder to get each and every one to understand that expression of feelings and ability to mediate with others where those feelings are in conflict with others is absolutely critical to the passage of life. And that if we are going to train our children to come through the rites of passage to become adults, then we need to be training them from as early as the primary schools and secondary schools as to how to express themselves and how to resolve disputes. Not every dispute merits action. In my New Year's address to the country, among other things, I spoke to a few things that we really needed to focus on this year. And one of them was working with each other to begin to see how we can ask people to learn that the conduct of themselves is totally within their capacity and that people need to learn how to take a done 
and that people need to know how to walk away. And in simple language, that is what has caused too many incidents to escalate into things that people regret. I know what it is to practice criminal law. I know what it is to go into the police stations and to see people who were appearing to be strong and big and bad, regretting every single act, appreciating that had they paused for a minute, they might not now be spending the rest of their life in circumstances where they have little or no control over everything other than immediate bodily functions. We have to pause. And we have to appreciate that, as I say to my cabinet all the time, transformation only comes with scale. If a few people are doing it, it is a nice topic for conversation. It is a good topic for academic research. But if we want to win the battle against violence, if we want to transform this country, if we want to ensure that the gains that we are getting in other aspects of our lives become sustainable, then we need to pause and to be able to commit each and every one of us to being able to be better at how we resolve conflict, to be better at how we express anger and disappointment, to be able to control jealousy. And all of this is a lot of fancy words for things that are so basic to each and every human being. I hope that the Office of the Attorney General, particularly with the minister that I've put in there now to deal with crime prevention, will work with the other social sector ministries as we have been rolling out programs to be able to publicly educate persons wherever they are at whatever station. I spoke to you just now about the schools and I will share with you that cabinet and in the preparation of the estimates which we are deep involved in um, over the course of the last two weeks that I've asked the Ministry of Education to ensure that we introduce a diagnostic instrument in every secondary school for every third and fourth former and fifth former to see where they are because we are conscious that the greatest tragedy other than those who were directly affected physically by COVID or in their households by COVID and the loss of persons with COVID have been our children. How many of us in this room could have survived the absence of three years of regular education. How many of us? Where would we be today? And therefore, it cannot be business as usual now that the schools have started back pretty much on a regular routine. We have to determine the status of each and every child because, as I said, when we passed the education white paper in 1995, each one matters. And we have to come up with an individual plan that allows us then to be better able to deliver the bridging deficit, to close the bridging deficit with each and every child. Because if we don't do it now, we will pay the price at some other point in our society and in our future. It is not an easy task, and therefore we believe that before we get further into anything else in this school term, that that diagnostic instrument is critical because it then allows the management of the schools, the principals, and the education officers to make clear decisions as to what must happen. What is our objective? It can only be not on bells and whistles now, but on functional literacy, functional numeracy, and the social and emotional learning targets being attained by as many of our children as possible. Now that's a fancy academic term, social and emotional learning targets. But it's a fancy term that seeks to do simply getting people to understand what becoming an adult is like, that it is about choices, that you have the ability to walk away, that you have the ability to breathe, that you have the ability to understand that walking away does not make you a coward and that when somebody steps on somebody's foot it may well be an accident give 
people the benefit of the doubt. And the ability to also recognize that we need to trust those with whom we are working. If we believe that teachers have responsibility for the guidance and development of our children, then parents can't be going into conflict with teachers in an unseemly way on school properties. There are ways to express your concern. And therefore, Professor Newton, I hope that while this may be the last in-person workshop of this Impact Justice Project, it is but one of many more to come that must start from St. Lucy and into St. Peter and into St. Joseph and into St. Andrew and go right down. How many times have you heard me speak about the defining difference of this government being committed to carry services to the people, not decentralize them? We cannot win the battle by bringing everybody to Bridgetown. We have to win the battle by resolving conflicts in the communities and the parishes in which they happen. And in those circumstances, it means that the effort to train has only now started. The Attorney General will have a responsibility after consultation for determining what offences and what conflicts ought to be mandatorily referred to mediation so as to ensure that we do not have to continue to overburden a heavily, heavily burdened criminal and civil justice system. And we believe that we will be faithful to our cultural roots because the reality is that there are so many societies and so many indigenous groupings across the world that understand that the importance of resolution of conflict is not necessarily about penalizing one party at the expense of the other. And that for justice to be restored and for justice to become whole, then it requires a completely different 360 degree approach rather than one that points a finger at persons and works at all costs to determine an Old Testament approach to the resolution of conflict. I hope that this is just the beginning because I genuinely believe, and this is not taught, there's a draft plan on justice, peace and security done when I was Attorney General in 2006 that set out clearly the importance of the principles of restorative justice. That it has taken this long for us to get there is regrettable, but that we have gotten here is critical and important. I trust that my voice hopefully will add to communicating the importance to Barbadians that this is not about a government now. This is not even about the community college hosting or the Canadians and the University of the West Indies and the Impact Justice Project. This is about your family, and this is about you, and your ability to be able to talk to your children and to be able to resolve conflict with children who are going through a difficult period in teenage years. They're not understanding where they are, what they want to do. They're managing all types of emotions, and you have to be able to help them resolve conflict. You have to help them appreciate that you don't go and cuff down or stab or shoot somebody because they tell you something that you don't like or because they step on your foot or because they like the same person that you like. Doesn't work so. And when last I checked, and you need to remind them, I never see a dead man walk or talk yet. Never see a dead man walk or talk. And regrettably, too many people have regrets when it is all said and done. We have the ability to make a difference in our lives. And whether it is fighting the epidemic of diabetes or whether it is fighting the epidemic regionally in conflict that leads to violence or whether it is in recognizing that guns don't move on their own either that it is only human intervention that causes a gun to be fatal or to hurt anybody. We have it within our capacity 
to make a difference in how we treat to each other and how we treat to conflict. Conflict is inevitable because we are not the same person and we will have different opinions on everything. But what must never, never be crossed is the disrespect for human life and human limb. And I trust and pray that our ability to move, as I said, from communities in the north right across the island, not only dealing with formal training sessions such as this, but using drama and using music and using other things to communicate the values and to reinforce the habit, the habit of knowing when to turn the other cheek, the habit of knowing how to express yourselves in the English language. You know, there was a former Minister of Education in this country who used to tell me as a young girl that part of the difficulty is that the average person only has a vocabulary of less than 100 words. It sounds like a strong indictment, but when you really think about it, they weren't too far from the truth. We have to master language. And language mastery and the way in which we use it will make all of the difference. There's a colonial bequest that regrettably has constrained us too much. And that is that we lose the capacity to be confident in formal settings. You bring a child in a classroom and it's difficult to get them to speak. The same child out there on the playing field is the most rambunctious and boisterous person and confident person. And we as a society have to learn how to be able to allow our children to be confident, to be capable of always being empathetic, and to be capable at the same time, however, of understanding that that confidence and empathy must live in the same human being. And therefore, it requires balance, and it requires sensitivity, and it requires your appreciating that you have the ability to determine whether that response will be in anger or in a way that reflects the capacity to reason. So I want to congratulate you, Professor Newton. I want to thank the Canadian government. I want to thank the community college for recognizing that this is an important social and community engagement. I want to urge the college to ensure that what is now a one-off set of workshops ought to become part and parcel of their national community outreach in being able to allow us to get in to the communities and to ensure that those people who have natural leadership capabilities, some are already justices of the peace, some are not, but that they come forward and that they allow themselves to be trained because in the real classic appreciation of who we are as a people, we know always that one, one blow is kill all cow. And it is unfortunate that the metaphor relates to violence, but the principle is what is important. Or you can use the other one that I carry, that many hands will make light work in us being able to reverse the cycle of violence that has come regrettably with the rise in prosperity and consumerism in our societies. The Western world has a lot to answer for. And in the same way that we have ignored the consequences of our values on the world in which we live and its impact on climate and biodiversity, we have ignored the impact of those values, regrettably, on our behavior in terms of our health, eating all that you want, where you want, how you want, if you want, and two, on violence in our society. Is my right to do this and is my right to do this and is my right to do that? without recognizing that there is no right without responsibility. That no house built unless maintained can stand. And that is not physical houses alone, but it is every other artifice or every other thing that we build, including our own lives. So thank you, participants, for being interested enough to be here and to be pioneers in this transition. We have had a Victorian system of justice for centuries. I do not fool myself in believing that it will change overnight. But I do believe 
that if we don't start now and start with earnest and scale, then we will be the victims, regrettably, of things that none of us want to see. I look forward, therefore, to helping to propel this island-wide and for this to be the basis upon which basic conflict in this country will be determined in the future. Thank you.